Okay, so for those of you guys who are using the new textbook, which is fine, uh, this is day two. Okay, and this is a separate set of homework and a separate lesson. For those of you guys who are using the old textbook and using the homework associated with that, the one that's actually in the day, by, uh, one that's actually in the lesson, um, or the lesson folder for for uh, problem solving on permutations and combinations, uh, it's just repeated twice. Uh, that's fine too. Whatever it is that you want to do. Again, if you look to the day by day plan, it gives you a list of questions that you can do, whether it's from the old textbook or the new textbook. Both textbooks do a pretty good job at it. It's just your new textbook kind of breaks it up into pieces. Um, and also teaches combinations and permutations at the same time as teaching probability, which makes for a very huge unit and a little bulky. So Mr. Colley and I, as, as a lot of teachers do, we break permutations and combinations into a separate unit and then later on come back to it. So anyway, just a different perspective on how we're doing things, that's all. Uh, so day two for some people, um, or day one, you're watching this video as well as watching the problem, problem solving involving permutations just because you're doing um, all the learning at once, all the lessons at once, and going through all the notes at once, and then of course going uh, to do your homework. Either way, it's over a two-day lesson, so <laughs> enjoy two days of what I would think is pretty much the most difficult types of, of questions for this for this course, but it depends on the person. Some people find it easy if they find permutations and combinations easy. Okay, so it's up to you. Anyway, uh, if you recall from before when I showed you the overall form for problem solving for permutations, um, we had a little bit of an unusual sort of abbreviation up here, uh, and but we still had our, our good old NCR down here. Now, again, these are problems that involve um, choosing subsets from larger sets, uh, and as a result, uh, it's a little bit more applicable. Um, but with permutations, of course, we worry about positioning or order or differences between the two, whereas in combinations, we don't worry about that. They're just groups. They're collection. Everybody's homogeneous within that group. They're all pretty much treated the same uh, as another, even though they may be different, uh, they're, they're the same part of the same group, and as an element, they are an element. Like, for example, if I was to group people in males and females, the collection of males and the collection of females, everybody's unique and different. They have different names and genetic comp composition, etc., etc., etc. They're all different, but those elements, to me, are males and females as I've categorized them. So that's sort of the idea. And, of course, that's where it becomes applicable. A uh, standard probability tool that we use for combinations tends to be card hands because order and positioning isn't that important unless you're playing you know, a, a game where things are actually in a specific order like war or um, Texas Hold'em and things like that, in which case things happen a little differently. But either way, here we go. Okay, so if you find out for probability, again, for involving combinations, we're going to involve obviously combinations. Our denominator is always simpler because it's the universal set, so it's NCR, but our numerator is going to be a subset. So I'm going to be taking away some elements uh, in general, overall, and then I'm going to be taking away elements uh, that I'm choosing as well. Uh, I'm not going to be choosing the whole set, or if I am, then it will be pretty much the same as the top and the bottom. But either way, so we're adjusting that. Again, the numerator is always smaller than the denominator, okay? Uh, because, of course, probability can't be more than 100%. It can be the same, but then it's certain. Okay, so let's look at some examples. You have a bag of Smarties with red, blue, green, yellow, and brown candy, okay? Uh, a meaning one of them, okay? If you choose two candies, Okay, now this doesn't have to be candies. We don't do this when we eat candy, but we do this when we're sampling from people in the cafeteria who are of different age, okay, or grade. Okay, so this is a standard structured, stratified uh, population sampling technique, except I'm using Smarties, which are more fun to deal with. Anyway, um, if you choose two candies from the one, two, three, four, five candies that exist, what is the probability that? Okay, so you choose a red and a blue candy. Now, it doesn't matter the order that you choose them in. Okay, it would say in that order. So it's not going to be a permutation. You've just got a red candy and a blue candy sitting in your hand when you had five in the box or five in the package. Okay, so this is what we're dealing with. So we start with, of course, NS. We do the pink. We have five elements. We're choosing two, so five choose two. Okay, that's our NS. Simple. Start with that. Warm yourself up. Get used to the ideas. Then what I do is I, of course, make a different scenario. Here it's got to be red and blue. For it to be red and blue, I only have two elements to choose from, red and blue. I can't choose anybody else. So that's my subset of the population. Okay, if you wanted to view that a little differently, then you would have this, and then you would have a group of two, which is red and blue, and then a group of three, which is not red and blue, or the other colors, and then we would be choosing two. So there's my two choose two. Okay, 
Uh, and two elements, two positions, two choose two. Okay, so the probability is two choose two over five choose two or one out of 10. All right, uh, still the same idea, although combinations you'll find at least we'll be dealing with smaller numbers, which makes it a little nicer, uh, unless we get to really big population sizes. Okay, uh, same scenario, same five candies. You fail to choose a yellow and a blue candy. Okay, so this is the probability of not yellow and blue. Okay, or fail to choose, same thing, not yellow and blue. Okay, so there's two ways I could do it, of course. I could go ahead and go for not yellow and blue. Um, but remember, keeping in mind that I could have yellow, but not blue, and blue, but not yellow. Anyway, uh, and then you fail to choose a yellow and a blue candy. Okay, so neither, oh sorry, neither of them are there. Neither yellow and neither blue. Okay, so it'll be the other three. One way to do it is to go one minus the yellow and blue, just like this question. It's basically the same question. Okay, instead of being red and green, it's yellow and blue. Okay, and you go one minus that to get its complement, which is not, in this case, yellow and blue. Okay, so that's one way that you could do it. So that's what I do here. Okay, I go probability of yellow and blue, just like the probability of red and blue. So my denominator gain is five elements, choose two. Okay, my numerator is going to be two elements, choose two. And as a result, I'm going to get the same um, uh, two choose two, which is one. Uh, and then five choose two, which is... Um, uh, 10, uh, 5 times 4 divided by 2, yeah, 10. Uh, so it's going to be um, 1 minus that, again, because we want not yellow and blue. So 1 minus, and then we go 1 over 10, 1 minus 1 over 10, and then 9 over 10. So the probability of not getting yellow and blue is 9 out of 10, okay, in those situations. All right, and so that's the scenario uh, that we're dealing with. Okay, next example. You are dealt a four card hand from a standard deck of cards. What is the probability that? Now, we always use deck of cards. The reason why a deck of cards is perfect to use is because a deck of cards is a, is a beautifully stratified population. You've got face cards, you've got numbered cards, all kinds of different subgroupings for the different types of cards. Then you have suits, right? You've got, you've got um, queens, or sorry, um, diamonds, spades, clubs, hearts. So that's four groupings that exist there. So it's a different level of stratification. Then you've got another level of stratification that's kind of related to the suits, but not related to the suits because, of course, it's going to be a color. So you can go red versus black uh, in the card hand. And then you can do all kinds of other things like, you know, aces and faces for different groups, or you could do even numbers or values for blackjack, whatever rules it is you want. It's a beautifully stratified population. And that's what we're getting at here. We're not learning these probabilities so we can count cards. We're learning these probabilities so we can stratify populations and look to see, is our sampling random? Okay. Or do we get some sort of skew or representation that's happening that says, okay, what's happening in my experiment is different than what's happening uh, by random chance, which suggests that there's some causality or some sort of thing happening in the background. And then you go from there and you make suppositions. So it's, it's all working towards what we call hypothesis testing in, in statistics. Okay. And looking at the difference between randomness and not randomness, which means something's going on. Hopefully something is if you're a scientist and you're trying to prove a principle. But anyway, I digress. Okay. So anyway, you were dealt a four card hand from a standard deck of cards. What is the probability of that? So four card hand, I'm choosing four from a deck of cards. Remember 52. Okay, so I've also got this diagram down here because it's a little bit more complicated. What is the probability that all four cards are hearts? Okay, and that means that I can only choose from hearts as my subgroup. No, nope. I won't get too far down myself. Start with NS. So NS is 52 cards, four choices, okay, to give me a four card hand. So it's 52 choose two, no, sorry, 50 choose two, 52 choose four, there it is there. I've done that. Now I'm used to the fact that I'm dealing cards. Then I have to say to myself, okay, hearts are a subset of the population. I have 13 hearts, but I have everybody else. doesn't matter what the other guys are because a success is hearts and a not a success or a failure is going to be not hearts. So it could be clubs or diamonds or spades. doesn't make a difference. Okay, so I've got two groups. I've got the hearts group and I've got the everybody else group. Okay, or H, and I call it H primed. Okay, that's our complement idea. Okay, or what's left over. So then I go 13, choose four, because I have to choose from the 13 hearts to get four hearts. So there's my 13 elements, four choices, 13 choose four, and it could be any heart, whatever it is. 13 choose four over 52 choose four gives us that particular value. Okay, so that's another combinations question. Again, I was too lazy to reduce it. Obviously, it can reduce by five and so on and so on. I was like, I'm like, forget that. I turned it into a decimal. 
Okay, and of course a lot of people even have calculators that can do that for them. I used to do it the old school way, and I still still do the old school way, but I just didn't have time, didn't want to bother. So I went down to the, the decimal version of it, which was approximate, okay? So it should be approximately equal to, really, when I do that, okay? Next example, you receive four queens. Okay, what's the probability that you draw four cards and you get four queens? Okay, well, how many queens are? Well, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. First, we do NS. NS is, I'm dealing four cards from 52, so it's 52 elements. Choose four. 52 choose four. There's my NS. I do that first. Now I get more specific. Four queens. Well, how many queens are there? Well, there's only four queens. So I'm choosing all of them. I'm getting all of them. Okay, so it's going to be four queens, and I'm choosing four of them. So four choose four. There it is. My numerator is one, my denominator is this huge number, and that is what it is. Okay, because there's only one way to get, draw four cards and to get four queens. There's only one, one way to do that. Let's look at the next example. Four face cards. Face cards are a bit different. Face cards can be a queen, a jack, or um, a king. Okay, and of course there's three of those for every suit. So three times four is 12 of those cards. Okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves. 52 cards, we're drawing out four, it's 52 choose four. Let's get more specific. Four face cards. Well, how many face cards do I have? 12. Which means how many not face cards do I have? 40. Don't really care about them right now because they're all from one group. All coming from the face cards. But we're going to start breaking them up into pieces afterwards. Um, so then we go uh, the 12, choose 4. 12 elements, 12 face cards. I'm going to choose 4 of them. I don't care which ones they are as long as they're all face cards. So my numerator is 12, choose 4. So it's 12 choose 4 over 52 choose 4, or 0 0.0018. Okay? Uh, the next one is, what's the probability that you receive 4 of a kind? Now that's a little bit different because there's variabilities in there. But it's kind of like 4 queens. Except instead of 4 queens, it can be anything. Okay, now if you're clever, you'll do it really quickly. But let's go start from scratch. Pretend that we had this question uh, from, to begin with. Again, uh, if we do 4 of a kind, well, let's say it's 4 twos. How do we do four twos? Well, there's only four, there's four twos. We're going to choose four of them. So that's our four choose four. Okay? Again, we're over our NS, which is 52 choose four, drawing the same four cards from a deck of 52. And then what we're doing is we're multiplying it by 13. Why are we multiplying it by 13? Because really we have 13 different types of cards that we can have four of a kind for. Not just queens, but four of a kind. So it could be four twos, four threes, four fours, four fives, all the way up to four aces. So as a result, we've got 13 of those, so I multiply it by 13. Or you can do 4 choose 4 over 52 choose 4 plus and do 1 for 2, for 3, for 4, for 5, for 6, for 7, for 8, for 9, for 10, for jacks, for queens, for kings, and then for aces, and then add them all up. But I'm just going to be lazy and multiply by 13. It's still the same idea because there's 13 different ways we can still get four of a kind. Okay? Next example is the best example, I think, because it segments the population into pieces that come from different groups, successes and failures. So this is, you have three sevens. Okay? Now, there's a couple of ways you could take it based on how it's asked. If you have three sevens, you're assuming you're not going to have four sevens. But you could take it as having three sevens and having four sevens, or you could take it as having three sevens and not having four sevens. So I guess there's two answers to this, but either way, we'll do it. Which way have I done it here? Uh, I've done it so that I have three sevens, and then the other is a different card. And it's logical, because you wouldn't say it has three sevens, and then include the fact that it has a seven uh, as the fourth card, because then you'd have four sevens, and that would be certainly remarkable. But either way, maybe there's a little bit of an error with this mistake if we take it specifically. Okay, so in this case, you have three sevens. What's the probability of having three sevens? Well, what we do is we have a, a sevens. Again, over the same NS, 52 choose 4. That part or should be used to by now. But for the numerator, for NA, I want three sevens. So that's what I do. I choose my three sevens. I've got four sevens. I choose three of them. You can see the little three I have here. So it's four choose three into this card hand of four. But I have to choose one who are from my not sevens. My not sevens are going to be every other card that's out there. That's why 4 plus 48 equals 52. As a result, this ends up being sort of two chooses. It's a 4 choose 3, that's my 7s, and then it's a not, not 7 or 48 choose 1. Okay, and that's my not 7s there, 48 choose 1. And then because I have to choose 3 and 1 to make my card hand of 4, I have to multiply those two guys together.
and it's it's diagrammed in here as well. Uh, so you multiply the 4 choose 3, which is just 4, and 48 choose 1, which is just 48, and then you get the numerator, and then it's all over our 270, 725, we've been getting all the way along, and 0 0.0007, so fairly unlikely to get three sevens. Now, I guess that probability should be a little bit higher if your interpretation is, well, what about getting the other 7? In which case, this number, instead of being a 48, should be a 49, and we include the other 7 as a possibility, but it doesn't have to be there. I kind of like this answer a little bit better, because if you got four 7s, you'd remark on four 7s. You wouldn't be like, oh, I have three 7s, and then another 7, unless you're trying to be tricky or clever or whatever. In addition, when you're choosing R elements from a group of N elements, you often choose successes and failures in a process, like we did here. Okay, so Mr. Henley's environmental science class has seven women and five men. If he chooses a small group of five, what is the probability that? So now we're choosing people rather than choosing cards, but it might as well be cards. All five are women. Okay, so a success is a woman, choosing a woman in this case. Okay, so uh, again, we start with our NS always. Okay, that's the pink. We've got 12 students, so 12 elements, five choices, 12 choose five. Those are all the possibilities that can happen, whether it's males or females or mixtures of males or mixtures of females or all females or all males. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, but here we want to have all five women. So we have seven women and five, we can call them men or we can call them not women. Not women is probably a little bit more politically correct uh, when we consider gender identity. So we have women and not women. People who identify as women, people who identify as not women, um, which is a, probably a little bit better way to do it. So thank you, statisticians. We're doing it right. Either way, a success is a woman, five women, so seven choose five. Now, we're not choosing from this grouping only because we have no men in our grouping that we're looking for the probability of because all five are women. Okay, so my numerator is seven choose five to go into my group of five. So I have seven choose five for my numerator, 12 choose five for my denominator. Again, that's what I figured out a long time ago. Figure out the number, four decimal places, beep, 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 done. Again, this should be approximately equal to. Okay, unless it's a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal, you always do approximately equal to. Okay, we go on. Remember, we still have uh, the same groupings. We've got seven women and five men or not women. Okay, in this case, three of them are women. What's the probability that three of the five are women? So that means we're going to have women as well as men. So that means we have to choose from two pools. Okay, a pool of successes, women, and a pool of failures, no offense guys, men. Okay, or not women is a better way to think about it. Okay, anyway, uh, so what we do again is we start with NS. We've got 12 elements. We've got to choose five from that grouping, so it's 12 choose five for my NS. And then we go to the specifics, three are women. So what do I do? I choose the women first. I choose the women from the women pool. I choose three women. So there's my three women. I can't forget though that the men also have to be chosen because I still have to choose a group of five. So I've got to have the three and the two make up the five in total. So I have to choose failures from the pool of not women. Five choose two for choosing the men or not the women. So again, we've got seven choose three, that's for choosing the women or the successes. And we've got five choose two, that's for choosing the failures or the not women. In this case, we're assuming men, but that's a little bit more binary than we should be, should, aren't we? Anyway, either way. So we've got uh, this number for the numerator, this number for the denominator. Uh, we're again multiplying them because I'm choosing three women and two men to make up a group of five, okay, in that group of five. So we multiply those two cho chooses and we get a value of 0.4419. Again, that should be approximately equal to. Mr. Henley is getting a little bit lazy there and not being exacting. Now, this is a good example for the very last one. This is probably what we'll end, off, uh, end up with, and we can look at all the other ones later on if you want to individually, because this is already getting kind of long. In this case, at least three are women. At least three are women. Now, what that means when I say at least, it says volumes because we have different circumstances. We could have three women, we could have four women, or we could have five women in our group of five. Those are all possibilities that are that are there, okay? So because we can have three or four or five, what we do is we break it up into three different situations. I've got them color-coded here. I've got three women in pink, I've got four women in green, and I've got five women in um, pencil, or I guess black or gray, whatever you want to call it, okay? Again, let's just do the three women, uh, group with three women and two men, or three women and two not men, okay? So I've got seven women, uh, and I'm doing the pink here, Okay, so seven women, oops, I 
mixed up the order for the colors. That's not good. Anyway, uh, we're going to do this one here. So we're going to have three women. So we go seven, choose three. So we have seven women, and we're going to choose three, okay, to make up our group of five. But then that means, of course, we've only got three women, so we need to have two not women. Okay, so that's our five, choose two. And then again, it's all over 12, choose five, like it was for the previous examples. That's three women. But four women, it's a little different. For four women, we have the same seven elements. We choose four individuals, but we still have one more not woman left or one more man left. And as a result, we choose that one individual. So we have a seven, choose four. That's to choose the successes. And we have a five, choose one. And that's to choose the failures. Okay? Again, we could have three women or four women or five women. And I go three W or four W or five W. So then I do the five W. That one's a little bit easier. We've actually already done this example, and we didn't do this part, but that's okay. It's good to have that in there so we know what we're doing. Remember, we're choosing successes and failures. So our success is five women from a group of seven women. So it's going to be seven, choose five. All right? We also have to choose from the five not women or men. Uh, in this case, it's five, choose zero. Now, five, choose zero is just the number one. It doesn't make a difference in here. So as a result... When we do it, we usually just do 7 choose 5 all over 12 choose 5, like we did on the previous page for part A. But in this case, it's nice to include choosing five successes and no failures. Because here it's four successes, one failure, three successes, two failures. Again, it's all over 12 choose 5 because we have 12 elements, 12 people, and we're choosing a group of five. Now, what's key is it's either three women or four women or five women. The or translates to a plus. The or translates to a plus. So try to keep that in mind when you're looking at it because it's three different cases and we're adding them all together. Now this is a beautiful one because it's combinations, it's successes and fails, it's got, um, it's got the multiplicative principle because you have three and two people together in a group, so three and two is a multiply, but then it's got an additive principle for the different cases or the different situations. And it also involves this at least scenario. So we're making large groups of calculations. This is actually something that lends to something called a hypergeometric distribution of probability, which we're going to be learning for next unit. Sounds difficult. Remember this because it's pretty easy. The rest of these are for card hands. Okay, We're not going to get too specific with those because it depends on how you interpret them, whether you're going to have uh, just that value or that value minus other values. So it does tend to be a little bit more complicated. So you can go through those if you want to. Okay, if you search them up on the internet, it depends on the perspective of the, of the question, whether or not you have a pair or a pair only, or if you have a pair and then only a pair, or whether you have at least a pair and so on and so forth. So most of them I've done at least four uh, for some of them and for other ones. Four of a kind, you don't have to do it at least four because you have all four of the cards. Okay, but I've done at least a full house and a flush and a straight and a straight flush. You don't have to worry about those. But for a pair and a three of a kind, I've done the at least version. So have a look at those, see if you understand them. If not, if you guys want me to do a video on it and to go over those card hands, let me know. Uh, in the lesson and I will do another video for you guys but this is probably more than enough you're probably tired now okay so get to work on the homework for those of you guys who are doing day two again go to the combination section in the new textbook or for those of you guys who are doing um, they're using the old textbook and this is the end of the lessons and you're tired okay try to redouble your efforts go over this stuff again and then get started on the homework that's assigned take care